afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I am here live in studio with my wonderful co-host, Rebecca Wood. Yes, and together we are about to create a legendary hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness. The wealth and health and happiness of your friends and family and pets and the, the critters that you see as you drive along and, and all sorts of things because we're all mixed up together and on this little tiny marble floating in space uh, called Earth. And uh, so if you're a resident of Earth, you're welcome to listen to this show. Uh, if you're not a resident of Earth, you know, let us know because, uh, you know, we'd like to aim our demographic at the people, you know, at, at whoever or whatever is listening to us. We probably need to just go over some more basic stuff if it turns out people not from Earth are listening. Yeah, yeah, and we'd be happy to do that with you. And uh, hopefully at some point... Gravity, fender foe. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure they know about gravity. You that's, gotta hope, that's everywhere. Yeah. But, um, but uh, we have a good show lined up for you today, a great show. We're going to just sort of chat here for the next 15 minutes or so. And uh, then we're going to have a live guest. We got a live one on the line. Our good friend Kevin Camps is going to be talking to us because... Unfortunately, uh, we had another little incident at Davis Bessie. Uh oh. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, I don't know if uh, you've listened. Some of you have listened to. Uh, I, I made a, a dramatic little thing a few months back about uh, a, something going wrong in a control room at a nuclear plant, and uh, the, the incident report reads eerily like the script to my little <laughs> uh, thing, which is on both our YouTube and podcast channel. So if you uh, just wanted to. Uh, review that, that that might help you uh when we talk to kevin uh then we're going to hear from our terrific advertisers and patrons uh rebecca is going to be talking to us about the rhine and then uh, ecological news and so forth and hopefully at some point during the hour we will hear from you if you can give us a call we'd appreciate it 877-909-1007 or text anytime during the show 419-973-5841 and uh, some days, you know, driving in, you know, I, I kind of try to figure out what I'm going to talk about during this first 15 minutes here. And this was one of those days that all sorts of little incidents happened <laughs> that I could easily fill this 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the first one was uh, as I was driving along I-75, uh, an airplane came down and uh, came right like lined up perfectly with my van so I could look over and like see the pilot of the airplane and uh, what he was doing was it was a spray plane and they were spraying pesticides on the corn crops and those those guys oh man that's that's amazing because he was literally flying under the the uh, wires the electrical wires uh, that went across the fields uh, in order to you know to get the corn crop sprayed with those pesticides and uh, cool as it is, you know, watching those those guys. There were actually two planes out today spraying the fields. It's just a reminder that they shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should not be having to spray pesticides on our corn crops. Uh, this this is an unsustainable practice, and it's been shown over and over again that the insects develop resistance. That's why pesticides that worked back in the fifties no longer work. And those pesticides cause huge damage to the environment and to us, you know, not Most just... Most things that are bad for insects, also bad for you. Yes, because biologically speaking, insects are actually a lot tougher than humans in a lot of ways. Yep. So if we're killing them, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favor either. And unfortunately, you know, right now there is organic ag agriculture and we, you know, eat organic whenever we can. And we have um, on our... In our uh, garden, you know, it's, it's completely organic, and 
the birds, you know, after 10 years, 12 years of, of having a yard with zero spraying, no pesticides, no herbicides, our insects are much tastier <laughs> than the ones around. So uh, every day we, we watch, and it's just like a, a buffet. The birds fly into our garden, they perch on our little rabbit fence, they spot a bug, they eat it, they, you know, or they take it back to their nest. Oh, we saw some hawks, by the way. We finally saw some hawks and some more deer this week. Oh, okay, hawks. So you're getting yeah. the predators. The predators are showing up in your little uh, inner you city ecosystem. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, so, but so that was something I saw co- on the way in today, and it was it was cool. But it, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. And the the uh, unfortunately the death rate among spray pilots is pretty high because you know when you're doing things like flying under the power lines uh, and brushing along the tops of the cord plants. That sounds a tad dangerous. It's pretty dangerous. So these guys are literally risking their lives on this corn, and unfortunately, ninety percent of that corn isn't for us it's not for our you know it's not for the roadside stands where you buy the the, the corn on the cob to take home and cook no uh, it goes to feeding uh, animals that we then eat so after they walk around and burn off some of the energy and right. fart and burp and what else whatever else they do and, and make it less efficient so you're not getting all of the energy and protein and stuff from the corn right yeah it, it, it takes you know we're using 10 times the energy to grow corn to feed the animals to eat the animals than if we were just eating the the corn ourselves. Although you can't just eat the corn, obviously. You need some beans, definitely. Well, yeah. <laughs> some beans and a little hot sauce, and you're good. <laughs> right. That's, what, that's Yeah, you need those Get sorts of things. your antioxidants. Right. You, you do need those sorts of things, but you, we don't, what we don't need and what most Americans are doing right now is we don't need meat with every single meal. Right. You know, just cut some meat out. And, and actually, if you do what I do, uh, I don't eat beef because that way you can cut out 90% of it since beef takes so much more energy and so much more food because the cows take longer to, to uh, grow to the point where you can where you can eat them, where it's profitable to eat them. So uh, by cutting beef out, I've, I've taken care of 90% of that. And uh, one other thing, or two other quick things I wanted to rant about before we go to our guests at 1015 who... I believe he's called in, so he's all lined up and ready to go. All right. Um, uh, first rant, I drove in really early this morning because I wanted to charge up my plug-in hybrid van uh, so that I could, you know, ride all around and ride back on a full charge. But I went to the Toledo Museum of Art, and I, I really love their car charger because they've got solar panels on the parking lot. You know, yeah. thousands of, well, you know, or hundreds... Well, it's a, it's like about a twenty kilowatt system, which is a big, it's a good system. So creates a little maybe shade, even a little smidge of rain protection while you're in the parking lot. Too. Yeah, it does. It protects the cars from the rain and the sun, and it po- gives power. And so when I'm plugged in there, I know that the, my power is actually coming from solar power. So it's really doubly cool. Yeah. But uh, they turned them off. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Why have it's annoying for some people? Why have car chargers if you're going to turn them off. I mean, it's really frustrating. And I, I have charged there in the past, and it's been great. But uh, so I, I asked Siri, I tried to depend on Siri, okay, where's the next nearest charger? She took me all the way out to the BMW uh, place in, in Sylvania, which... Mind you, Siri doesn't like Joe very much. <laughs> That's true. We we have a very complicated. We're not sure if that's actually about the scarcity of chargers or about you know yeah. some sort of internal thing that Siri is going through. But let's just say that's not the first time Siri steered me <laughs> terribly wrong. <Right. laughs> uh, but uh, we so I drove out there and I charged up. But but the driving out and it turned out, of course, this was a BMW deal, dealer. And the thing about car chargers is some of them are free. Like, right. like the one at the museum is free, which is doubly or triply why I, I like it. Uh, but some do charge. And actually, the charger at the BMW dealer in Sylvania was the most expensive charger I've ever plugged in at. Right. I well, mean, they, they have higher quality electricity, no doubt, because they're BMW. <laughs> right, right. Their electrons are fancy. Yes. Conditioned power. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But uh, look like <laughs> the stable thing, I'm pretty sure. charge point. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, 
part of President Biden's infrastructure bill, he has said, he has publicly said he's going to increase the number of electric car chargers around the country. So that'd be good. I really, I really hope he comes through on that particular promise because less nukes, more chargers, Joe. Yeah. Here, here. Other Joe. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The big, that, that Joe at the the DC Joe. Yeah, right. We'll call him. And the final rant I want to make before we go to Kevin. Uh, I was listening to C-SPAN on the way in. They were talking about COVID. And uh, I I had this week, I, I'm co-chair of the Wood County Green Party. And we were all set to have a booth at the Wood County Fair this year. We we had put down our deposit. I got the insurance for the event. I practiced making our vegan cookies, which is what, what we sell at, at our booth, vegan cookies and T-shirts. But this past week, the number of COVID cases in Ohio are, are tripling and it looks like we're starting on a on a fourth surge, a fourth wave, and we we canceled. You know. Yeah, I didn't want to say nothing, but I have had a feeling for a while we were in the eye of the hurricane, and I better enjoy these in in the studio shows while we have them. Yeah, because uh, we may not next week. We may go back to the the call in process because, and listening to C SPAN on the way in, I heard directly. From the people who are causing this problem. Oh, that's nice. And it was, you know, because they have their call-in line, Republican, Democrat, Independent, and they were talking about COVID. And the people who were in there spouting this absolutely crap pseudoscience to, to, to defend their decision to both not vaccinate and not wear a mask, uh, it, it, I think like, what, okay. The, the vaccine, maybe I get it. You know, you know, science has steered us wrong before once or twice. Although mostly it gets things right, I think. But really, a mask it's a piece of cloth. Yeah. If it doesn't work, what have you lost? You're right. fine. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah. Wear the mask. And and I, I think that what happened is that or what should have happened and what we kind of try to do on our show to the best of our ability, because we had actual vir- virologists come in and talk. Um, and you can go back and listen to those shows on our podcast and YouTube video. But what we should have done is taught people what happens when you introduce a new virus to a population of animals. Any population. Okay? Because like it or not, folks, we are animals. <laughs> we're, yep. we're in the animal kingdom. And viruses follow the same rules when they attack humans as when they attack, oh, I don't know, sea turtles or rabbits or and people really think out there that, that you know they owe their good health which they've enjoyed up to this point in their life to uh, uh, vitamin c and positive thinking or something you know yeah yeah and and so you know if we had taught people from the beginning this is what viruses do in populations and here's you know a thousand times we've studied this and this is always what happens and what, people have been writing books since the 80s uh, telling us okay more and more new viruses are going to because people population is expanding and there's air travel so right more viruses are going to be getting into humans and, and evolving and spreading right and this, remember remember this and they remember ebola and they when it first came out and they remember aids that was new mm-hmm. <laughs> right and this so and this is what viruses do when they get into a new population they First, they, they spread like crazy because there's no resistance and the virus really is only competing with itself to get at these new new hosts. And so you get the more and more virulent strains. And, you know, this is exactly what happens. And this is what we said would happen. And one of the most frustrating things that uh, I heard from those C-SPAN ignoramuses, <laughs> excuse me, can I say that on the radio, ignoramuses? Yes, Josh is nodding, yes. I think you can. It's yeah. not a cuss word. Is that they use the fact that the virus is mutating, which is what we warned against, which is what we said would happen if we didn't stop the virus. We said if we didn't stop it, it's going to start mutating and be more virulent. They're using that somehow to justify, to say that they don't need to take the the uh, inoculation. They don't need to take the, the vaccine because, look, it's it's mutating. You know, the scientists obviously didn't know what they were talking about. And Actually, they said it was going they to mutate. Said they it said, it said that. To, yeah. Right. We told you it was going to do that if we didn't stop it. And now that it's doing it, they're saying, aha, look, it's doing that. You never expected that. You never told us about that. Yeah, pay attention in class, people, and get a vaccine and put your mask on because 
I really wanted to have a fair booth. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I, this stuff is starting to get to me. You know, I was okay through the first round, but it's like now, okay, we're just going to do the stop and start stuff forever, you know? Yeah. And that's but now, apparently. And that, the scientists are telling us, is literally the worst possible scenario in order to, to like generate the most lethal virus that'll kill the most people you get about half the people vaccinated and half unvaccinated really just just letting everybody die and not trying to do anything to stop it would have been better than what we're currently doing now Right, exactly. Or what would be really great is actually having effective lockdowns where people are paid so they don't have to worry about about choosing between dying and being unemployed and homeless. Right. Uh, that really would have been ideal, you know. And we were kind Second of Second to that, that would have been just degree. letting people die. and and But no, oh, oh. yeah, it's, yeah. And, and, you know, it is going to the, point, get to the point where we'll have to shut down. Again, yeah. But they're just waiting for more people to die first. Well, and it, I don't take any pleasure in the fact that those people, the ones at greatest risk for death right now, are the ones who are have, are responsible for not getting vaccinated and not wearing their masks and, you know, essentially creating the problem. They're the most at risk right now. I don't want to see even them. I don't want to see even that population removed from the our population by disease because it's like watching the 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 wino sitting out in the sun you know getting heat stroke and alcohol poisoning at the same time you know right. and, and it's like oh the, I, I wish there was some way you could not do this to yourself you know yeah yeah so so again listen to science <laughs> go get go get your vaccine and go get uh, go get your mask on right now all right and so now, also right now, we are going to go to our guest, Kevin Camps. Hello, Kevin. Are you with Good morning. us? Morning. Yeah. I'm, yes. I'm sorry you had to listen to that that rant. We went went a little over on our <laughs> on our That's time okay. here. But it's Joe. What do you say? We are in a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the reason I asked you on this week was we had a kind of an intense experience over there at, at Davis Bessie, the, the nuclear power plant. That's just east of the city of Toledo there. Uh, July 8th, uh, could you sort of give us a, a, an overview of what happened? Well, there was a reactor trip that was due to a turbine trip, and that was the beginning of the Keystone Cops episode, a combination of operator screw-ups and equipment failures, which um, is kind of like the latest version of this at Davis Bessie. But a couple of the kind of highlights or lowlights included a loss of water, a low pressure level in the steam generator, which is very serious and can get even more serious very quickly. And the other um, important thing that happened was an over cooling of the reactor uh, pressure vessel itself. And the reason those are significant, I mean, uh, strangely enough, uh, the best example to show why a low water and pressure level in the steam generator is a problem comes from Davis Bessie itself back on June 9th, 1985. It had a similar situation, only worse back then, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission referred to this 1985 incident at Davis Bessie as the worst accident since Three Mile Island. It was a loss of cooling to the reactor core for 12 minutes due to the malfunction of the steam generator. And it required um, some Indiana Jones style uh, manual mitigation actions to try to undo the problem before a meltdown ensued. And then on the overcooling of the reactor and the reactor pressure vessel, the reason that that's so significant is that Davis Bessie, like other pressurized water reactors, uh, there are some in the country that are worse than Davis Bessie. One of those would be one of the reactors at Beaver Valley, so close to the Ohio line in Pennsylvania. Um, it's the neutron embrittlement of the reactor pressure vessel, which weakens the metal, makes it brittle. And if you activate the emergency core cooling system, which is cool water hitting that hot vessel, it can be like a hot glass under cold water, except imagine more than a ton of pressure per square inch on, on the vessel. And you can actually have a through wall fracture of the reactor pressure vessel and if that were to ever occur, you would lose the cooling water in the core because the only reason it's still in liquid form is it's under such intense pressure. So once that hole opens up, the cooling water supply turns immediately to steam and escapes. And now you have an uncovered core 
which will melt quickly. I mean, certainly within an hour or two, you'd have a, you know, pretty much a complete meltdown. And then your last line of defense is the containment structures, like the shield building, which at Davis Bessie we've known since 2011 is severely cracked. And then in 2014, they, they bothered to mention to us that, oh, by the way, it's cracking worse with every freeze-thaw cycle at Davis Bessie, which happens many times per year, you know, in the fall, in the winter, in the spring. So who knows how bad the cracking is now? There's so much secrecy about it. Yeah, that was the latest incident at Davis Bessie, combined with another one that just got announced, a special inspection team from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will be sent out there, not just to look at this uh, event, this incident that happened earlier this month, but also something that's been going on for a couple years now. They've had five failures of emergency diesel generators at Davis Bessie in the last couple years. So that's going to be the focus of the special inspection, which are pretty rare. And again, Davis Bessie has a history of emergency diesel failures. Like back in 1998, when the tornado had a direct hit on Davis Bessie, and they came precariously close to not being able to cool the reactor core sufficiently because both of their emergency diesels were dysfunctional at that time. So you can see this is but the latest example of kind of a plague of problems over decades at Davis Bessie. Yeah, I, I like to say that in the race to the next meltdown, Davis Bessie is the clear leader. If I, you know, if I had to put money on this in at Las Vegas, yeah, I, I'd be betting on Davis Bessie. But uh, so let's back up just a little bit. So back at the start of this, we said that there was a on Ju- July eighth there was a trip. Uh, could you just, you know, that's a nice euphemism, but could you tell us what that means? Well, there was a malfunction with the uh, turbo generator. And so they, if the turbo generator is not working, um, it's not immediately necessarily a safety problem, but it's, um, it means that there's no electricity reaching the grid because your turbo generator is not functioning. So it makes no sense to even be operating the reactor until you can restore the turbo generator, which will take days to reset. So that was the, the incident, the stumble that caused the need to shut the reactor down. But uh, once things start falling, once dominoes start falling, you can get into the safety significant realm. And that happened in due course with that very incident. Like I mentioned, the, um, the steam generator, essential to cooling the reactor core. And that's the thing is, um, I mean, take Fukushima Daiichi in Japan, for example, in 2011. The reactors there, the three operating reactors, actually shut the moment that the earthquake struck, the 9.0 earthquake. The sensors detected the earthquake. The reactor scrammed, which is an acronym that stands for Safety Control Rod Axeman, which was the cooling rod um, technology of the day back in 1942 when Enrico Fermi fired up the world's first reactor. But they stuck with the term scram, shut down the reactor. That happened at Fukushima Daiichi, Japan. But the thing is... You have to cool reactors that are at 100% power for some days before they are safe and stable. And that's what failed at Fukushima Daiichi was an hour into the incident, the tsunami wave hit. And the grid had been taken down by the earthquake for the most part or entirely. And then the tsunami wave took out the emergency steam generators. That was how it happened at Fukushima Daiichi. But there are other pathways to loss of the grid and loss of emergency diesels. At Davis Bessie during that 1998 tornado, the grid was lost largely to entirely by the tornado damage. And then the diesels didn't work properly. And so they had a very dicey more than 24 hours at Davis Bessie. And to give credit where credit's due, I remember Dave Lockbaum at Union of Concerned Scientists at the time, who's had a long focus on Davis Bessie because of how dangerous the plant is. And he pointed out that in that 1998 tornado incident, that not, if it hadn't been for really the superhuman efforts of the plant staff keeping one of the diesel generators sort of alive and operating, uh, it could have turned out much worse at Davis Bessie. So, you know, you have to credit the, the plant personnel at Davis Bessie when they get things right, and then you got to criticize them when they don't. And this most recent incident on July 7th, 8th, um, you know, Dave Lockbaum said in an email regarding that incident that you won't get into the reactor operator hall of fame with a performance like that. He was referring <laughs> to what just happened at Davis Bessie. So he calls him as he sees him. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so once again, Davis Bessie putting the essentially the the lives and the the homes of of all of Northwest Ohio at at risk by uh, by you know again basic mistakes in operation that and huge risks by dumping cold water into a hot reactor and uh, and <laughs> we dodged the bullet again and that's you know if you're playing Russian roulette. You know, eventually, if you spin that chamber enough times, you're going to hit the one with the bullet, and and I think that's kind of where we're where we're heading with Davis Bessie. So, I, I don't think there was enough attention paid to this in the, the local media because you know, as usual, the NRC, uh, for one thing, they they didn't call this an emergency, right? They they used a, a lesser a lesser nomenclature to describe what a little kerf- kerfuffle or something like that yeah <laughs> well here's here's the quote uh, due to the reactor pressure protection system actuation while critical this event is reported as a four hour non-emergency <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah okay. so we had we had the the reactor protection system had to activate and we were at risk of possibly fracturing the the contain you know the inside or the the reactor for four hours. But it was a non-emergency because because it didn't melt down. I guess. Okay. I, I don't know. So all right. Well. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> I actually pulled up the numbers. You mentioned Northwest Ohio being you know destroyed by a reactor meltdown at Davis Bessie, and actually there's a report from 1982 that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission commissioned. They got Sandia National Laboratory to perform it, and then NRC once they saw the figures tried to cover it up. But now Senator Markey from Massachusetts got it revealed uh, through his uh, congressional hearing powers. And I'm looking at the Davis Bessie numbers from this report that is most often called um, CRAC-2, short for Calculation of Reactor Accident Consequences. And the acute radiation poisoning deaths that could result at Davis Bessie downwind are 1,400. And uh, radiation injuries are 73,000. And the latent cancer fatalities are 10,000. And then this is kind of a dated figure for property values, um, $84 billion in 1982 dollars. And I've got it updated, but only to 2008 dollars here, $185 billion. Probably if you adjust for inflation to today's dollars, that's probably over $200 billion. And there was an AP investigative report back in 2011 that said, hey, look, you know, these figures in this report that the NRC tried to conceal anyway. I mean, the population growth around plants like Davis Bessie since this report was written in 1982 are are huge population increases. So these casualty figures are very much lowballed in the here and now. So yeah, that's the kind of figures we're talking about. Not to mention the multi-billion dollar sport fishing industry that has sprung up around Davis Bessie since then. You know, hundreds of people go out there walleye fishing literally every day and uh, all that would be gone if davis bessie melts down because nobody's going to want to go into lake erie for the next oh that ten thousand years or so um yeah okay well thanks for catching us up on on the latest uh of davis bessie's okay. near misses and uh, but i okay. i just want to uh touch real quick you know a lot of things are happening in uh washington and you know nationally in terms of this question of whether we're going to pursue a nuclear future for the trying to get carbon free or if we're going to go with what works, which is the, the wind and the sun. Um, so anything, any new developments that you know of up there at, uh, going on in the country? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, um, between Congress and the White House, there are proposals. And again, these are, you know, Democratic majorities, a Democratic White House um, that range between the tens to hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money to bail out the old reactors in the country, like Davis Bessie, and allow them to keep operating ever deeper into uncharted risk territory, but also to subsidize new reactors as you know, often uh, justified as supposed climate mitigation techniques. So it's, um, you know, it's a dead end. Like we're going to waste all this money and we're going to waste all this time on unproven new reactor designs. And in the meantime, the climate catastrophe is going to worsen and worsen because it's not solving anything. And then on the old reactors, I mean, like we've been talking about, the risks with age degradation are, are quite significant. So 
it's just a real mistake. And NIRS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, has organized a national pushback to try to stop this from happening um, in these infrastructure bills that are under discussion right now. But it's interesting, you know, that the deep history of Davis Bessey is so fascinating to me. I'm, I'm reading a book by Dennis Kucinich just out called The Division of Power and Light about his experience as city councilman and then mayor of Cleveland back in the 1970s, taking on Cleveland Electric Illuminating and Toledo Edison on Davis Bessey and trying to save the municipal uh, light system in Cleveland. And these shenanigans, these deceptions, this corruption and criminality go all the way back to the beginning at Davis Bessey, and they're still there now. And you know, when we were fighting the 20 year license extension at Davis Bessey, which kicked in after 2017, um, the reason they were trying so hard to get that license extension was a hope of a bailout from the state of Ohio, which they got, and then it got taken away. That's a whole can of worms right there, but yeah, HB6. it's usually about the greed. All this mm-hmm. huge risk taking is pretty much about the greed, you know, so it's kind of a bad combination. Well, I think that nuclear power is fundamentally an immoral thing, you know, cursing our descendants with 200,000 years of pollution. Uh, so that we can have a a couple seconds of electricity is fundamentally immoral. And so it's hard to find uh, upright, decent, honest people to to build nuke plants because uh, you have to start out making that decision. I don't care about future generations. I want my money now. Um, And so then it's not surprising that these are the people that pay bribes, that, uh, you know, falsify reports that play down accidents like this non-emergency we just had, which almost, <laughs> which could have, you know, one more mistake added on to the mistakes already made. Uh, we Again, we could have lost Northwest Ohio. So, all right. Well, so glad you're there, Kevin, and, and well, willing to come on and, and to help us out, help us understand these things. Could you just tell people how, if they're interested in your organization, Beyond Nuclear, Uh, how they can keep up with you. Our our website is uh, just beyondnuclear.org. And, you know, you can sign up to get our our weekly newsletter and just check out all the info we have on nuclear power, radioactive waste, nuclear weapons. I mean, here here comes the Hiroshima and Nagasaki commemorations yet again. So look for an event near you to plug into on August 6th and August 9th. All right. Well, thanks very much, Kevin. And and, uh, we'll we'll keep on top of this and (laughs) see if there's more. And so... Thank you very much for coming on here. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. And, uh, you know, if you're somebody who's decided to go ahead and uh, give Biden a call or give your Congress people a call and tell them, you know, get those nukes out of there, go ahead and mention the the July 8th incident because, you know, once again, they're risking everything to do this corrupt, terrible thing, which is... uh, unnecessary now now that we have wind and solar at utility scale the whole thing just just seems like it's you know matt green by the way of uh Bertolt Brecht, possibly. I think Mac the Knife <laughs> is actually in charge of this whole thing. <laughs> could, could be. Could be. Now, uh, we get to hear from our wonderful sponsors. I can guarantee that this is a, a zero corruption uh, broadcast. We're, we're not getting money from First Energy, obviously. But we are getting... Yeah, they don't like us. No, they don't like us. <laughs> At all. But we, are, uh, we do have a wonderful advertiser in the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy, from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And if you want to find out what's going on in the Wood County Parks, uh, it's pretty easy. You can call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. Uh, You can also go to their website, which is simply wcparks.org. And I recommend this. You can download their app. Go to any app store and search for WC Parks. And uh, you can download that and you'll see some nice photos. People, including myself, have taken of the parks. And uh, they are on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc., etc. So that's the Wood County Park District. Four Green Futures also brought to you by our patrons, and these are wonderful, fantastic, uh, incredibly intelligent people. I, I'm coming up with a better, you know, adjective every week for these folks yeah. uh, who are who have made the decision that they're going to actually support 
something that gives them information they're not going to get anywhere else by going to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and uh, searching for For a Green Future, up pops all the different membership levels, and they've just picked the membership level that fits their budget so that they feel no pain in, in doing this. And uh, we're very, very grateful to, th- to them because they're the ones that help us keep this show on the air. And uh, join them, won't you? <laughs> because um, if you're most people... You probably, until you heard this show, you probably didn't know that your home, you know, your, your whole and your whole life was uh, within a four hours of uh, being completely overturned by a, by an accident at Davis Bessie, which again, you know, they, they have to be, I guess they would have to be the luckiest people in the world because they have had more near misses with that nuke plant than any other nuke plant in the world. And every time we, we managed to just scrape by by the skin of our teeth and uh, uh yes so won't you join our patrons and uh, go to patreon.com and support for a green future okay now uh we rush on and time is a ra- ra- racing away here uh, we're going to hear from rebecca rebecca all righty well uh this week i was attempting to find out what had happened flooding wise last month in karlsruhe germany which happens to be the city where my parents were married and where i was conceived no comment on the order of that <laughs> harder than it sounds because uh first of all i don't i don't read german that well so i can't just look at the karlsruhe picayune tribune or whatever it is it's probably not called that <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and also uh the name karlsruhe comes up a lot in reports about the flooding but then there's no information because they're, they're it named its name just keeps coming up because uh there's a flood control warning center there <laughs> there's a flood warning center there so that was kind of foresightful to put your flood control warning center in a place that's going to flood yeah. well <laughs> you know it may not have flooded all that badly it may not have flooded all that badly because a the rhine river it used to be on the rhine river but the rhine river was straightened and now it's just a backwater and a couple of tributaries around there hmm. and you know it may be put there purposely because it's near enough the river to watch the flooding but far enough away that you won't have to deal with the irony of your flood warning center being underwater because <laughs> okay. when 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 you think of, of germany you don't think now there's a people who really appreciate irony that's not your first thought anyway you know maybe True. some of them do but yeah it's not <laughs> so anyway yeah so that evolved in me to like trying to understand the basic geography of the Rhine. Um, apparently, it's, it starts up in the Swiss Alps, and and, and one of the tributaries I, I found this kind of cute is called the Vorderrhein, which means the pre-Rhine, sort of <laughs> the proto-Rhine. Okay. <laughs> so, right. yeah, yeah, it starts up in Switzerland, uh, goes through. Let me see. Austrian Liechtenstein winding its way down there on the what they call the Upper Rhine. Then for a long time, it's like the border between France and Germany, which has been very controversial. You know, some Germans were very upset about this. You know, they made statements like the Rhine is a German river; it's not a border. <laughs> so, and then, I don't. There was some sort of accord about that a long time ago. It's been the border for a while. People are sort of okay with it now, I guess. I hope anyway. And uh, then eventually, it uh, it, it uh, veers off through. Germany and through Holland and empties out uh, empties out in Holland into the North Sea. It's got this handy thing called Lake Constance. I think a couple of mountain lakes that kind of act as natural flood control because they sort of you know fill up and slow it down instead of everything just racing down really fast. Um, yeah, I don't know. When it straightened, it, w- it was also widened and deepened. One hears that in some places like the Mississippi, for example, that has backfired. Because, you know, a nice meandering channel also sort of acts as flood control because it tends to slow the river down and whatnot, you know, make it go off into side channels, you know, instead of just emptying out a whole big bunch of water really fast. So, yeah, not sure if that might have uh, contributed in some way. Um, it's apparently 820 miles long, or they downgraded it in 2010 to maybe it's only 765 miles long. <laughs> That's not, interesting. They must not be counting something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a debate about whether to count things or not. Hmm. Or maybe somebody just messed up when they... They didn't have a long enough uh, tape measure. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it was the straightening. Maybe it could be. Maybe yeah, when it meandered, it was longer. <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure how you make that kind of. Business. You talk to cartographers, but yeah, it drains 85,000 square miles of Europe. Uh, interesting fact: the name for the Rhine in Italian is Reno. Reno. Okay. Reno. Yeah. So if your name is Reno, it 
probably means guy that Italians, the main thing they remembered about you is that you're from the Rhine area. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's actually, it's from the Celtic Reynos, okay. was the original name of the river. Uh, yeah, uh, it, apparently uh, one-fifth of the world's chemical industries are located along the Rhine, which is why 6,000 toxins, separate toxins, have been identified in its waters, which is not great. Um, it has more, according to what some people's reckoning, more old and famous cities than, than any other river. Um, the middle line between Bingen and Bonn is apparently the, the most scenic. It's got all the castles and things <laughs> that you can see from the river. It's oh, nice. Yeah. In the 1860s, when it was was when it was straightened and partially canalized, and uh, that's why there's a lot of backwaters and cutoffs near uh, a lot of places like Karlsruhe, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, the Rhine flooding last month, as of July 17th, the death toll is up to 170. That's, uh, I think, Germany and Belgium combined statistics. Uh, the North Rhine-Westphalia and Rhineland-Palatinate states got hit the hardest. Uh, and you know, the German government, the vice, ch- oh, v- vice chancellor o- Olaf Scholzhoff? Scholzhoff, I think. No, no, just Scholz. Olaf Scholz of the Social Democratic Party uh, called for increased efforts to protect the climate. Uh, Maybe partly because he's trying to replace Angela Merkel, just saying. (laughs) So again, (laughs) Ryan, Mm -hmm. political football for many centuries, still doing that. (laughs) Okay. Um, Interestingly, I found out there's a thing called the Flood Prevention Scenic Trail somewhere like up in the Bad Württemberg uh, Black Forest region area. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a couple of nice dams you can look at. You know, it's got little signs explaining the history of the construction of the dams. Big sort of, you know, mountainous lakes above the dam. And uh, it's closed right now. One thing that keeps coming up when you try to research Karlsruhe and the flooding is that the flood center there says that do not be a great bloody Amazon and, and uh, go and look at the, look at the you know, walk out on the dam and look at it. See how badly damaged it is. Ooh, isn't that interesting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is not. Uh, a prudent thing to do is go look at a, a dam which is about to break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, so far, I mean, it didn't have a catastrophic uh, damage, but there was damage, and they they said they're afraid that uh, people and their pets will frighten wildlife into jumping into the water or something. Hmm. Not to mention, you yourself and your pet are probably going to fall in, but. You know, yeah. <laughs> apparently they're like, they don't have that much sympathy for you. You could have just not done that. Uh, yeah, some sometimes it does get hard to be sympathetic to some people. Yeah, yeah okay. a little bit sometimes. Yeah, so referring back to our earlier uh, discussion of COVID. All right, well, thanks very much. Not Rebecca. a good place for to take a selfie. Seriously, just no. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Right, maybe there'll be a bunch of, like they'll have a concert there, a maskless, vaccineless concert on the edge of the dam, which is about to fail. And, right. You know, uh, it'd be, it'd, you reach a point where you have to say, you know, they brought it on themselves. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much for that uh, discussion of the Rhine. And uh, it's still lots of time to have uh, somebody call in or a concert or make a comment. You can call in at 877-909-1007. Or uh, t- send us a text at 419-973-5841, and we'll drop everything uh, just to talk to you. Time now for our eco-news segment, ecological news. Uh, Got to start with the fact that the world is burning. <laughs> Oopsie, yeah, not the, again. The whole planet. Still, whole actually. Planet, really well, still. the whole northern hemisphere uh, on fire right now. Um, we got, there's a story in Gizmodo, uh, called uh, Six Major Regions. Uh, let's see here. Here are Six Major Regions Literally on Fire Right Now by Brian Kahn. Uh, it's a story that was uh, released on July 30th. And I'm just going to run through the list because it's important to know. One, uh, Western North America. So everywhere from California up into British Columbia. Ew. Thousands of fires, uh, most of them uncontained. And we are still a good two month and a half two months away from peak fire season so uh we that's not looking good because uh, the, the the dry santa Ana winds haven't even gotten going yet and we've already got literally thousands of fires and the thing about wildfires they move very very quickly <laughs> yeah and uh, number two siberia again record fires they had record fires last year record fires uh, this year 
the tundra fires are burning. And one thing about tundra fires is that, you know, whenever there's a fire, a forest fire, there's a release into the atmosphere of carbon that has built up there over the centuries, right? And like up in the British Columbia, you got some old growth, 2000 year old forests. Uh, when the tundra burns, it releases 10,000 years of stored carbon because that's been building up there since the last ice age. So that's a lot of carbon when you're just burning the ground, burning tundra. Western Mediterranean is on fire. Spain, Sardinia, the island of Sardinia. Is, Ooh, I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, burned almost to the ground. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh. <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> Turkey is on fire. Massive uh, forest fires like they've no, never I seen think I before. Heard about. Yeah, also Lebanon. Oh, there was some big resort that had to be evacuated in, yeah. the, in the turquoise coast or whatever it's called. Right. The Turkish Mediterranean. Right, where a lot of oil executives like to party, but uh, uh, that party was interrupted. Yes, it oh, was. Sad. Uh, Lebanon is on fire. Uh, the, the famed cedars of Lebanon are burning. Oh, crap. And uh, the number six on the story from Gizmodo. Uh, Finland. <laughs> wow, Finland. Yes, Finland, a new entry into the burning to the ground country. Uh, it's they've got right now. The fires in Finland are actually fairly small, but the fact that they're happening at all in Finland, which is normally not fire prone, uh, is a very dangerous. Well, they like building with wood a lot there, too. I, the, the, I have this friend who lives in Finland. He's an American photographer, and he likes to go back and forth and document differences, but, uh, similarities between Finland and places in America that were settled by Finns. And mm. they both, like, have a lot of very nice pine work. Yeah. Yeah. And Shiny, light and a, brown. And it's a, very good. Yeah. I, I love Finland. Yeah, if you've ever watched the movie Earth Girls Little Easy, you'll probably love Finland, too. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I would add a seventh, of course, which is just, you know, talked about so often that probably he didn't even feel like it was necessary to add. And that is, of course, the Amazon, which is being burned at, again, record rates. Yeah. So uh, we got seven. Earth is on fire. That's our first story. Uh, second story, revisiting a story that we've been covering for the last three weeks, four weeks, continuously here. And uh, as you recall, last week we had on uh, an atmospheric scientist, Mark Jacobson, who uh, reassured me that the Earth by, was not, you know, that we were not on the edge of catastrophe because I was very concerned that there was no substantial drop in CO2 between May and June uh, of this year, as there has been in all the years past. Well, uh, July numbers are out and uh Again, no substantial drop in carbon dioxide. Yeah. And the drop historically between June and July has been very large, at least, like at least two and a half parts per million. Uh, this year, the drop between June and July was uh, less than a half a part per million. So it's just a tiny little drop. And so here we are two months in a row now where the, the expected springtime drop in CO2 did not happen. And the, the explanation is pretty simple. I mean, if the world is on fire, it's putting more carbon dioxide into the air than those plants that aren't on fire are able to take out. Does rather stand to reason. Yeah, and which is all part... And when you burn plants, then there's less of them. Yeah, <laughs> right. The, woods, so... the burning plants are not absorbing carbon dioxide. Rather a... Perfect it's, storm. Yeah, it's hard to carry on photosynthesis when you're on fire. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I I don't lightly contradict scientists, especially specialists who know way more than I do, who are, you know, PhDs and have been studying it for decades. But there are some times where in my life where I have found I do have to go against what, a, what the experts say. And I personally, for me, this is one of those times. I'm looking at this graph. I'm seeing no drop between June and July. I'm saying I'm calling catastrophe. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm calling catastrophe levels of CO2. If so. we're not at the edge of catastrophe, we're not far enough away from the edge. Right. So uh, that's, I wanted to report that story because I said we would keep on looking at these numbers and those the thing about catastrophes not is not to go right up to the edge. Yeah, there's no point. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. That n accomplishes nothing good. Right. Uh, anyone out there disagree with me? Please, please disagree with me. Perhaps another scientist has heard me and said, hey, there's Joe being alarmist. <laughs> uh, we should correct that. Yeah, correct that. Call me, 419 973 
5841 for texting or 877-909-1007. We will put you right on. And because, we double dog dare you. Because we're desperate to hear some reassurance yeah. at this point. All right. Uh, next story, uh, Biden's infrastructure bill. You may have heard that the compromise infrastructure package is uh, probably going to get through Congress now. Uh, unfortunately, it, it does not do enough for uh, the environment. Earth Justice uh, released a press statement saying that this is nowhere near enough in terms of uh, taking care of the environment, improving public transit, et cetera, et cetera, because the Republicans managed to cut most of that out or a lot of that out. There's just a little bit left in it. And it relies heavily on carbon capture sequestration, sometimes called CCS. And uh, the S in CCS stands for scam because yeah. uh, carbon capture has never worked. They've been working on it for 30 years. The idea is you're going to catch the carbon and pump it back into the ground. Lots of fundamental problems with that, not the least of which... The oil fields they want to pump it into are full of holes. <laughs> right, of Be course. Because you've drilled holes in the field to get all the oil out. So now you're going to pump a gas back in, and it's not going to find its way back up through those holes, those thousands of holes you've drilled yeah, in the oil field. you got to think. Yeah, it, it is. It might take 100 years, but it's coming right back out again. So at a time when we, according to the graphs, are near catastrophe, we don't have time for this kind of... This kind of capitulation, I, I was going to say negotiation, you know, and compromise, but no, now it's no longer compromise. It's no longer getting, making a deal. Now it's just capitulation. Now it's just, yeah, you can go ahead and destroy the planet because uh, we want it, you know, look good politically. So uh, not good. And usually I like to end the show with a, an upbeat story. Um, and I, I guess I can kind of make a report uh, just personally on my, my garden. My three sisters project is going great. Uh, my corn is now literally 10 feet tall. Wow. And we've got, you know, ears of corn coming out everywhere. we got the silk and we've got tons of squash on the vine and we've, the beans are starting to show up. Uh, so that's that's nice. But um, overall, folks, this, this is a, an alarmist episode of For a Green Future because uh, I'm seeing some very alarming things. And, and you know, when they make it harder for the people that are trying to do something individually because the, the country's not doing it as a whole, you know, when they, when they do things like uh, put penalties on solar panels the way they're doing in Bowling Green, when, when the Toledo Museum of Art turns off its car charger, you know, they're, they're, they're making it almost impossible not just for some people to uh, do try to do the right thing. Personally, they're making it harder for all of us to survive because we need to be improving this infrastructure. We need to be encouraging the, the solar power installations. We need to do literally everything we can to go completely 100% carbon free. And uh, every time somebody makes a decision in the other direction, uh, they're hurting all of us. Just like, you know, when somebody decides not to wear a mask and not to get vaccinated and to go to big crowded venues where there's lots of people and hug and kiss people they don't know and and uh, you know lick lamp posts and things like that <laughs> they're not just hurting themselves they're hurting all of us because they can become a vector a carrier of that disease and uh, spread it to everyone else so unfortunately folks what we all do for, on our own decision affects everybody else and so that's both a good thing and a bad thing and Let's make it a good thing. So get out there, make the right decision, get yourself an electric car, put up solar panels on your house, and tell everybody to get off carbon. So thanks very much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. And this is Joe Damar signing back on with a rare correction. Um, in this episode, during the live broadcast, I talked about how the uh, graph of carbon dioxide hadn't shown any drop between... Uh, June and July. Well, it turns out, thankfully, I was wrong. Uh, the NOAA had not updated their graph with July's numbers, even though it was already August. And in fact, they still haven't updated and put in the July number. So what I was looking at was the, the May to June drop and not the June to July drop. So I went back, once I realized this, I actually 
did the calculations myself, and it does look like there's around a two parts per million drop between June and July, which is good news, which means the catastrophe isn't going to happen this month anyway. So apologies to everyone if I scared you. And again, it's just uh, sort of a reminder that usually the people with the PhDs are, are correct. <laughs> so um, sorry for that mistake and uh, very happy I was wrong. And uh, But we'll be back next week. Thanks very much for listening. This is Joe DeMar signing off again. Black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time.